So my talk is called Education and Urban Crises, Coercive Neoliberalism and the Politics of Disposability. So in November 2008, Rahm Emanuel, who at that time was Obama's chief of staff, and he's now, as I said, uh, the mayor of Chicago, told the Wall Street Journal, quote, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. Um, I think he was sort of um, mimicking what the um, OECD said, um, and the OECD is a site for the creation and distribution of policy discourses on urban development. The OECD made, quote, don't waste the crisis, end quote, the first of its Barcelona principles adopted in 2009 after the, the Wall Street crash. Oosterlink and Gonzalez point out that, quote, crises are moments when hegemonic understandings of political economies are called into question, end quote. This opens up space for multiple interpretations of the causes and solutions of crisis. So in my talks today and tomorrow, I want to build on this idea to examine neoliberal urban responses to the crisis and counter-hegemonic possibilities. And I think I'm talking about the ways in which hegemony is being, I, I would not say undermined, um, but is being perhaps pushed, challenged, whatever, from both the left and the right. So in the US, the state at all scales is pushing austerity and privatization. I think everyone knows this, right? Um, this is a class strategy to make the working class and the poor, especially people <coughs> of color, and sectors of the middle class pay for the costs of financialization, speculative real estate investment, and corporate profiteering run amok. So um, in my talks today and tomorrow, I'm gonna look at the intersection of neoliberal urbanism, race, and education in the US, which is what I've been doing. But I'm gonna be looking at it in the wake of the crisis. So how has the crisis affected that intersection? I argue that education policy is mutually constitutive of this post-crisis austerity strategy. Specifically, education is a leading edge of coercive neoliberal urbanism through appropriation of black urban space, abandonment of students of color, and political exclusion. At the same time, the crisis and the state's coercive strategies open up fissures in neoliberal hegemony and possibilities for alternative counter-hegemonic solutions. So I'm working with ways here in which hegemony is a strategy, as a strategy, of enrolling subaltern social groups and classes and other class fractions um, into a dominant agenda, the way in which um, that is actually being undermined or shifted by the crisis and the response to the crisis. In the new political economy of urban education, I argue urban education policy is constitutive of the dynamics, the contested dynamics, of power that shapes the urban context, especially the role of capital and race in structuring urban space. My analysis centers mainly on Chicago um, for a number of reasons. One is I'm there, um, and I can actually study it. Um, but also, um, Chicago is not just any place. Um, Chicago was a birthplace of the whole neoliberal education agenda. And it's also an exemplar of neoliberal urban development in the US. With the Chicago teacher strike uh, this last September, Chicago has become the epicenter of the pushback against it. So Chicago's a rich case to study, and more important probably to me, to participate in. However, as a crisis further differentiates winners and losers among cities, it is apparent that neoliberalism is, to quote a uh, phrase that Brenner, Peck, and Theodore use a lot, they're critical geographers, if you haven't read them, you should read them. Um, they use the term that neoliberalism is variegated, um, that it's very, it, it works very differently in different urban spaces and contexts, right? and that it's adaptive to those contexts. So it's adaptive to cities' particular histories, their governance structures, their institutional apparatuses, 
their relationship to the global economy. So what I'm beginning to do now, and I do some of that in this paper, is I'm beginning to look at comparatively Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia, which are very different kinds of cities, and in which the, the similar processes are operating, but they look very different in these different contexts, and trying to understand sort of the, the dynamic relationship between the contents, context and these larger educational processes. As Peck and Theodore point out, this is actually in a chapter that's in press that I got from Nick Theodore um, on um, um, Chicago. Um, and in, in this chapter, <clears throat> they point out that political elites have mobilized particular socioeconomic imaginaries and institutional arrangements to develop, institutionalize, and politically entrench neoliberal market-based and finance-driven economic, political, social, and spatial urban restructuring. Not the least of these are white supremacist discourses of racial pathology. Neoliberal urban development in the US context is intertwined with historical patterns and current realities of white supremacy and racial oppression. So in the New Political Economy um, book that I wrote, um, and other writings, I argue that urban education policy is shaped by and contributes to the intertwined logics of capital and race that constitute neoliberal urbanism. So that's sort of part of the theoretical framework that I'm, I'm working with. David Harvey, in his latest book, points out, and he's definitely not the only one who's pointed this out, um, that cities are at the center of the contradictions of contemporary capitalism its neoliberal strategies, and the current protracted economic crisis. Reliance on real estate and debt financing made cities particularly vulnerable to the crash. Reliance on, realism, on real estate and uh, debt financing are two key neoliberal urban growth strategies. The US municipal debt market is, uh, anyone would like to take a guess, $3.7 trillion. In order to function, Debt finance cities need, need consistent access to credit, to credit markets controlled by the Wall Street banks. The recession, which I guess that's the term I'm going to use right now for the crisis that we're in. Um, the recession and shrinking tax revenues have made city governments increasingly subject to their discipline, to the discipline of the Wall Street banks. Cities are also bearing the brunt of the fiscal crisis. In a continuation of the devolution of federal government responsibility for social welfare that began with Reagan, remember, when, when the federal government in the US, for those who aren't from the US, began um, cutting funds to cities and turned over a lot of social, social welfare type responsibilities to cities. So beginning with that. So this is really what's happening today is really a continuation of that. The crisis is being systematically offloaded downward that's possible, from the federal government to the states to the cities. So in that sense, cities are also bearing the brunt of the crisis. Plus, cities are the sites that um, have a disproportionate to other um, kinds of geographical areas. Um, they have um, high, higher concentrations of so, social welfare benefits, of, of, of public services like transit, and public sector workers who are also at the brunt of the crisis. So cities are at this point. So I want to be clear about one thing when I'm talking about crisis, fiscal crisis. The crisis is both real and constructed. There is a real structural crisis of capitalism, a long-term crisis of stagnation and overaccumulation, for which neoliberalism, financialization, and globalization were meant to be fixes in Walden Bellows' sort of triumvirate, which some people see as all part of globalized neoliberalism. But um, those are meant to be fixes. For, the, for that structural crisis of capitalism. These fix, but these fixes, fixes were actually what triggered the global financial crisis of 2008. But because there is a crisis does not mean that, um, um, that people are clear about the nature of the crisis. What has happened is that global regulatory bodies and finance institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, um, and state um, governance bodies at, at all scales have reframed the financial crisis as a public debt crisis. 
Naming and constituting the problem this way has opened space for certain policies and solutions and foreclosed others, as Clark and Newman point out. From Greece to Chicago to the fiscal cliff, political and economic elites are using deficit panic to further downsize the state and offload potential bank losses onto working class and low income people. They are unwilling to make the banks pay for the crisis, even though the banks were responsible for the crisis, nor are they willing to draw from the vast untapped revenue sources that actually exist. Um, Michael Moore, I think when he was in Madison, said um, the country's a washing cash. Um, so, you know, we have untaxed corporate and financial profits, public giveaways of land, uh, subsidies to developers, bloated military spending, tax breaks for the rich, etc. So the, there are there are sources of revenue, um, but they're un, unwilling to tap them within in their framework. So instead, they're dumping the crisis um, downward. As the crisis rolls downhill from the feds to the states to cities, cities are laboratories for the discursively constructed necessity to impose austerity and privatize public goods as the only way to restore fiscal solvency and investor confidence, promote growth, and compete globally. I will be getting to education. Um, just realize that. Um, this frame is embedded in a powerful neoliberal social imaginary that circumscribes possible solutions and limits the parameters of social struggles to that which is possible within neoliberal urban development and capitalist relations. So um, as an illustration, I attended a conference. Um, I teach at UIC, University of Illinois Chicago, and I attended a conference there uh, in December that was titled Metropolitan Resilience in a Time of Economic Turmoil. This was a, a research <coughs> opportunity for me. Um, the, at the conference, there were officials from various cities, um, Chicago, State of Illinois, Cook County, also Columbus, Las Vegas, um, Pittsburgh, a number of cities. And they all invoke the same narrative. There's a dire fiscal crisis. We have to impose austerity. And we need to follow the solutions dictated by the financial markets. Firmly boxed into neoliberal ideology and institutions, they reiterated the necessity to adapt to what they called throughout the whole day the new normal. Business, one, one of them said, quote, business as usual is over. We couldn't continue if we wanted to. The financial markets won't tolerate it, end quote. So in this discourse of inevitability, union wages, retirement security, health benefits, and public provision of social services were excesses of a profligate era, a blip in an otherwise normal drive, a belt tightening social insecurity and individual responsibility and survival of the fittest, the new normal. Working and middle classes will be expected to endure an even deeper decline in incomes and living standards, an acceleration of the economic polarization and transfer of wealth upward that has characterized the past 30 years with the worst borne by those most economically vulnerable. A report by the Pew Charitable Trust projects, quote, that the lo what they call the local squeeze, which is what I've just been describing, as the new normal far into the future. A U.S. government accounting office estimated that local expenditures will have to be cut by 12.7% each year until 2062. 2062. So this is a new normal. Okay, so I want to switch gears here for a minute. <clears throat> Over the past 30 years or more, dominant social forces were able to implement their political economic agenda, the neoliberal agenda that we've been living under, by winning broad support to their values and goals. In education, neo neoliberal ideology infused its dead practices, um, infused institutions and social relations and identities at all scales, as Michael has really written about extensively, um, Stephen Ball, other people like that that many of you are familiar with. Um, and, and I think what um, Michael and Stephen and others have shown is that um, that neoliberalism has become um, has sort of saturated our consciousness and our practices and become uh, uh, normalized. Okay. Yet, as neoliberalism intensifies inequalities and deprivation, the state has selectively relied on coercion to contain and exclude those perceived to be redundant to capital 
and dangerous to the neoliberal order. I, I think we're familiar with this. So there's a lot of discussion about hegemony, but we don't want to forget that some people have been subjected to consistent coercion. In Gramsci's conception of the integral state, hegemony and coercion are in dialectical relationship. Although technologies, technologies of consent are deployed to conceal the need for coercive rule, coercion, to quote Gramsci, remains the indispensable condition of social order. So I am now going to talk about education and the politics of austerity and coercive neoliberal urbanisms. What I want to argue is that the state is, intensif is intensifying coercive governance in education to make people of color, particularly African Americans, pay for the crisis. The so-called fiscal crisis provides a warrant for city governments to close dozens of public schools across the country, eliminate elected governing bod bodies across the country, and dismantle whole school systems, as is underway in Philadelphia and Detroit at this moment. They partner with billionaire venture philanthropists like the Gates, Walton, Rowe, Dell Foundation, who deploy their enormous wealth, which, by the way, was accumulated through the whole neoliberal globalization strategy, right? Off the, well, I, I won't go on, but off the backs of the um, indigenous seeds that people have been using for 10,000 years, um, um, people's water, uh, et cetera, right? Labor. This is a coercive strategy that is qualitatively different from de-democratization. So, you know, let me back up because I'm, uh, that little interlude may have confused things. So what I'm arguing is that this strategy to close schools and um, eliminate elected governing bodies and dismantle school districts is a coercive strategy that is qualitatively different from de-democratization through the indirect power of state actors that typifies neoliberal governance. In the new political economy of urban education, I argue that processes of disinvestment and reinvestment in public schools are located in the devaluation and revaluation of the urban built environment. Disinvesting in schools, closing them, <coughs> and rebranding them is part of selectively devalorizing junking and revalorizing urban space. So spatial theory, I think, is very helpful to us to understand the interconnections between what happens uh, between education policy and the remaking of the urban environment in this way. Um, and, and the goal, of course, is for capital accumulation and, in some instances, racial containment. This process is shaped by histories of racial segregation, inequitable investment in public schools, and cultural politics of pathologizing black urban space. Across US cities, the economic crisis has provided the impetus to qualitatively accelerate this process, literally transforming urban school districts. So Chicago and Detroit provide two um, somewhat different um, examples. Over the past 40 years, Chicago's political and corporate leaders took advantage of the city's relatively diversified economy, <coughs> its position as a center of commodity and trade, uh, transport, its corporate and financial headquarters, and its consolidated political machine to reinvent the city as a, as a node in the global economy. So there were certain conditions in Chicago that made it more possible to do that there. Deploying neoliberal growth strategies centered on global finance and business services, downtown development, gentrification, and tourism, Chicago emerged as a global city with stark, starkly contrasting landscapes of poverty and wealth, which anyone can see if they get off the mag mile when they visit Chicago. Chicago's education policies of the past 18 years evolved in relation to this agenda. It was Chicago that pioneered education accountability and closing neighborhood schools to support the city's economic competitiveness and to expand education markets and facilitate gentrification. This was, a, this was coupled with something that's less well known and very pertinent to my discussion tomorrow especially. It was coupled with expanding selective enrollment schools to attract the middle class back to the city. So they had this sort of variegated strategy. All this was facilitated by institutional relationships between the Commercial Club of Chicago 
and um, Chicago Public Schools and, and the mayor. A submissive teachers union and a tightly controlled political organization. In the face of the extended economic crisis that we're in now, Chicago's positioning in the global economy and this whole inst institutional governance structure that they have developed over this time has allowed it to do something really remarkable, which is it's actually pushing ahead with its growth strategy at the moment when um, other cities are, are really retrenching. So um, to quote our, our mayor, Rahm Emanuel, or some people's mayor, um, quote, we're not just riding the wave, we're trying to accelerate ahead of it. He said this in spring of 2012 as he launched an audacious $7 billion public-private infrastructure trust project, which would pool funds from private investors for public infrastructure projects. But, I mean, this is a public-private partnership of massive proportions. And few cities have the economic and the political strength to do something like that in this period. However, at the same time, Emanuel is closing, calling for closing over 100 so-called underutilized schools. Um, these are neighborhood public schools to fix a putative $1 billion um, school, uh, school district budget deficit. And um, that's a very disputed reality. Um, they're, every year they have a budget deficit, they say, and every year they end up with a surplus. Um, but what it did report shows far less than a billion dollars as a deficit. Um, so that's all very disputed. And we don't live in a city where there's a lot of transparency going on. Um, and so we, we actually don't know, but that's the claim. So this, this budget deficit is, is, is a justification to mostly dismantle mostly dismantle neighborhood elementary schools in the African-American south and west sides of the city, two huge swaths of the city. However, whether the city can bear the social costs in community destabilization and grassroots opposition is a question that I'm going to talk about uh, tomorrow. When I, I'll return to that tomorrow. But meanwhile, Chicago Public Schools has also budgeted over $100 million for a new selective enrollment school in the South Loop. So they have this development strategy and this austerity strategy, and those two wings of the strategy serve different, are addressed to particular populations. Destroy illustrates how a quite different urban context shapes the state's response to the crisis. Its economic base, ravaged by decades of offshoring, auto manufacturing, and capital flight, the city lost almost half its population in the last 20 years and more than half its public school enrollment. Detroit's remaining population, which is 82% African American, has an official unemployment rate of 10.8%, in fact, a much higher rate. It has a tw in 2011, it had a child poverty rate of 46%. Unable to gain a foothold in the restructured global economy, Detroit has lurched, floundered, um, churned, whatever language you want to use, from one urban development scheme to another in an effort to compete for investment, middle class residents, and tourist dollars. So for Detroit, the, the economic crisis was yet another blow, a huge blow. The confluence of the crisis and the election of a Tea Party governor provided the impetus to impose a politics of extreme austerity, displacement, neglect, and disenfranchisement. This is a class and race war on Detroit's mostly black mostly poor residents. I, I'm not using hyperbole here. It's basically what's happening. The city has already cut public sector workforce by one-fifth and frozen their wages. Lacking the economic positioning and institutionalized public-private <coughs> governance apparatus of Chicago, the corporate elites and the right-wing foundations that are converging on Detroit and their political partners are casting about for a new strategy. And they have one. They proposed to reinvent the Motor City as a smaller, leaner, whiter, global niche city focused on transportation and entertainment. So they have a new downtown entertainment district. Minus economically impoverished African Americans who along with other workers were the source of the automaker's wealth and the city's former prosperity and vitality. Framed as right-sizing the city. So there's certain language that you now see popping up in cities across the country. The new normal is one, right-sizing is another. 
in Detroit framed as right-sizing the city, the crisis provides an opening and rationale for the state to massively close schools and seize disinvested neighborhoods <coughs> that are, quote, too expensive to maintain. The African-American homeowners who live there will be relocated, and the land will be banked or repurposed for new investment. Um, and uh, four days ago, the state legislature um, approved a city manager who to <coughs> oversee this project. So as in Chicago, education is a key component of the strategy. So I, now I want to talk about that more in terms of appropriating black urban space. In summer of 2012, Chicago Public Schools drained its reserves. This is something that's totally unacceptable if you're a budget manager or, I don't know, financial person or whatever those people are called who do this, um, draining your reserves. Um, and this was a move that was widely seen, and wisely seen, as a ploy against the teachers union, i.e. we're completely broke, we have, don't have a, even a dime left, and so how could we possibly give you anything that you might be asking for? Um, but it was one that cost um, Chicago Public Schools, which is an independent taxing district, um, a reduction in its bond rating. In the fall, the mayor declared the school district was a billion dollars in the red, as I just explained, and that it had 140 so-called half-empty schools. The fiscal crisis could only be solved by right-sizing, he used the term right-sizing, the district, a la Detroit, Philadelphia, etc. Um, by closing underutilized schools, which for some reason all ended up being in, almost all ended up being in black communities because they were just too inefficient to operate. Never mind that there are other schools equally utilized even by CPS's measures, which are not in black communities and are apparently okay to operate. At the same time, the mayor signed a compact with the Gates Foundation to open 60 more charter schools and 40 additional new schools over the next five years. It turns out, this is, I could document this. I'm not making this up. It turns out that closing 100 schools would save the district at most about $80 million. And that's not counting for all the cost of transferring students to other schools um, and maintaining the buildings. Some people have said it would be a wash, actually. If it did, does save, did save them that much money, this would be a minuscule 1.5% of the district's annual $5.3 billion budget. Underutilized schools are yet another form of distressed property ripe for investment. Schools that are not mothballed for future real estate deals are rebranded as selective enrollment schools to serve new middle class residents or converted to charter schools or turnaround schools, which are privately operated, that receive an infusion of public dollars. 33 of Chicago's 100 charter schools rent facilities from CPS for a dollar a year. Um, CPS's $660 million capital budget plan for 2012 allocated almost $125 million, that's about a fifth of the entire budget, to 11 schools that the district turned around or closed and reopened with a private operator. Chicago has 600 schools. This is 11 of them. In November 2010, UNO, which is a charter school operator, whose CEO was um, uh, Mayor Daley's chief Latino ally, and was Rahm Emanuel's campaign finance chair, was awarded $98 million by the state of Illinois at the very time when public education funds were being cut. And UNO just got another $35 million more in state funds, um, even as Chicago Public Schools is saying that they have to close schools because they don't have resources. UNO specializes in charter schools and Latino communities, and they're embroiled in a massive scandal right now. In Chicago, as in Detroit and Philadelphia, school closings are justified by the logic of fiscal austerity. In a time of budget deficits, it's too expensive to operate half to empty schools, we are told. But under-enrollment is not a natural process. It's being naturalized, but it is not a natural process of demographic change. It's produced in the nexus of geographically selective disinvestment and reinvestment, lack of affordable housing and jobs, and education policy. There is a, a reason why people move out. These policies reduced Detroit's population by more than 50%. They pushed out New Orleans, historically rooted 
African American population, and they contributed to the loss of 181,000 African American residents of Chicago in the last decade. Um, Chicago Public Schools lost about 30,000 students, not 145,000, which is what Rahm Emanuel is saying, over the past decade, but added over 50,000 charter school seats. Some under-enrolled schools are surrounded by charter schools that have siphoned off their students. So a combination of economic policy, real estate development, and education policy produces under-enrollment. In African-American communities that have experienced the dismantling of public housing and decades of disinvestment, under-enrollment and closing schools is yet another form of state investment. So Detroit now is an even more radical case of appropriating black urban space through education policy. Here the local state acts within quite different economic and governance constraints and opportunities than Chicago, as I explained. In 2009, the newly minted Obama Department of Education made Detroit a test case for its plan, which became Race to the Top, which was uh, to provide recovery funds to cash-strapped school systems in exchange for following the Chicago model, which is closing failing schools, taking over school boards, um, expanding charter schools, and uh, imposing mayoral control on the districts and running schools like businesses. So what followed was mass school closings, privatization, and disenfranchisement. This is Detroit's experiment in post-crisis intensified neoliberalism, neoliberal urbanism. Detroit's budget cutting experiment is to clear cut low income African American areas and consolidate residents in so-called opportunity zones or push them out of the city together, altogether, a kind of Bantistan strategy. In April 2011, Detroit's Mayor Bing announced plans to downsize Detroit. This is another buzzword we're hearing. Closing schools, eliminating city roads, shutting water lines, reducing garbage pickup, and turning off streetlights in certain so-called depopulated areas. Um, essentially discarding low-income black neighborhoods and people. The Detroit News reported in 2012 <coughs> that approximately 40% of the streetlights in Detroit are out. It is worth remembering that Detroit, a city with a large unionized black working class, had the highest rate of African American home ownership in the U.S. I think it's a very stark, um, I think it's important to remember that because I think it helps us understand where we are from where we've been. For the corporate elites and right wing foundations converging on Detroit, low income African Americans are a drain on the city's economy. The city's going to clear the land where they live bought homes, raised families, and created community in the way in which um, actually George Lipsitz talks about it very eloquently in, in his new book, and hold it for future development. City leaders have suggested that plowed under former black neighborhoods that were dotted with community gardens might be turned into corporate farms, rebranding Detroit as a green city. Tom Pedroni, who writes um, a, brilliantly about Detroit, and from whom I've learned basically everything I'm saying right now, um, writes that school closings are part of, quote, an effort to unlock real estate value currently so-called contaminated by a population in need of containment, end quote. <clears throat> in Detroit, Chicago, and elsewhere, schools and black communities have been central to placemaking and the struggle for the right to the city. Quote, within this struggle over for whom the city exists, Schools in Detroit play a vital role in maintaining or relinquishing one's stake in the city, which is why they are central to both the fostering of and resistance to neoliberal urbanism. So we have to understand the significance of closing these schools. As in post-Katrina New Orleans, a strategy of forceful expulsion of African Americans, and part by seizing their schools, as Kristen Burris puts it, can hardly be called hegemony through persuasion nor can the related conversion of black community assets and black children into investment opportunities. Uh, Stephanie Simon reported in Reuters, I don't know if you've read this or not, that investors are, quote, pouring private equity and venture capital into scores of companies that aim to profit by taking over broad swaths of public education, end quote. Citing school districts' budget woes and pension fund shortfalls, investors are optimistic. She quotes a private equity investor in Boca Raton who said, Boca Raton, Florida, 
There's more receptivity to change than ever before. That creates opportunity, end quote. In the U.S. alone, K-12 education is a $650 billion investment sector opportunity. There is money to be made managing charters, investing in charter buildings and learning materials, speculating on, char on the charter school growth industry, and getting tax credits for investing in underserved communities. This post-crisis austerity operates on the terrain of the already neoliberalized city. This is important. This is not just another cutback. This is on, on a terrain which has already been ravished by all these, um, all, all the cuts, all the reductions in wages, all the, the losses um, that people have experienced. Many public school, schools serving low-income African American and other students of color in Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, New York, and other cities have already been subject to, to repeated rounds of neoliberal experiments. Chicago Public Schools has already reduced them to test prep schools, stripped of the resources and programs that constitute what is defined even mediocre public education in the U.S. The economic crisis has provided the rationale to abandon these schools altogether. In December 2011, um, CPS's chief operating officer, who was also uh, an uh, officer in, a, um, in the big turnaround agency in Chicago, admitted that CPS did not intend to invest in schools that would be closed in the next five to ten years. So there might be crumbling buildings or whatever, but they wouldn't be investing in them. I think it's not efficient. Charter school chains staffed by a revolving door of untrained novices and online learning companies will provide schooling in areas that are largely abandoned by the state. The few remaining public schools will be further reduced to safety valve or alternative discipline schools for charter push-outs. The social fallout and contradictions from this strategy are already beginning to surface. Um, I, I was talking with um, someone who just returned from the Journey for Education Justice um, it was actually January 29th in, in D.C., which is 20 cities around the country, African-American parents and students who banded together to file a civil rights complaint against school closings. And one of the Detroit students said that uh, in her high school, she attends classes that have 63 students in the class. In Chicago, the turmoil created by school closings has contributed to a horrendous rate of youth violence, which you... Um, or youth homicide, I'm sorry, um, on the south and west sides of the city. The abandonment of public education as an avenue of opportunity or even safety in the crisis-ridden post-Keynesian welfare state instantiates what Boaventura Sousa Santos called societal fascism. In an intensified state-organized survival of the fittest, some people are deemed disposable in a nation of high unemployment, fiscal austerity, competition for scarce resources, and unmitigated profiteering. In some Chicago African American communities, closing public schools is part of a nexus of closing public mental health clinics. They've just closed the remaining few public mental health clinics in the city. Dismantling the remaining public housing. These are not high-rise public housing units that have been allowed to, to you know, completely deteriorate. These are low-rise um, public housing units that are completely um, you know, um, rehabilitatable. Um, you know, there have been increases in youth violence, so there's a nexus of these things. It seems that the state has given up on social reproduction for these communities. It will likely respond to the ensuing social turmoil with further policing and containment. This is a, a totally unsustainable, and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. So I, I want to end by talking about what I call governance by political exclusion. To facilitate this strategy, the crisis legitimates state, state takeovers of the school districts and whole cities. Appointment of financial managers with nearly unlimited powers, and I describe that in Detroit. Um, mayoral takeovers of school boards, which we've had in Chicago since 1995, and it's now the model for this across the country. And appointed governing bodies with no political accountability. Political disenfranchisement is, is actually very critical to enabling it's indispensable to enable the appropriation of black urban schools and state abandonment. Driven by intertwined logics of white supremacy and capital accumulation, 
this is um, very different from um, the kind of de-democratization de that we've seen in the past. Michigan is ground zero for black disenfranchisement. Um, so, um, as you know, um, that under Michigan's new, does everyone knows about this? Michigan's new financial uh, manager law. Um, the state officials can appoint an emergency financial manager with sweeping powers to run school districts and cities that are facing so-called financial emergencies. So we construct a financial emergency, then we need a financial manager to take over the city. The EMs are empowered to restructure social services, disband school boards, determine academic plans for school districts, and void union contracts, and they have legal immunity from lawsuits. A representative of the state treasury office said the motivation for the EM bill was, quote, to show bond rating agencies that we are working aggressively. We think they will look favorably on this, end quote. In 2011, Michigan's white Tea Party government <coughs> abolished the authority of Detroit's elected school board and appointed an emergency manager. He was a former General Motors executive to run the school system. His charge was to close public schools and convert others to charters. Um, the state also created um, a state-run so-called recovery district. This is a la New Orleans. So New Orleans was really the test case for this whole particular neoliberal experiment. So we see these tests, different cities are being test cases for different things which then kind of get rolled out um, similarly or differently in other contexts. Um, so I don't know where I am in this page, but um, so this is a la New Orleans, um, this recovery district. It is, it's supposed to be a statewide district. It's only composed of the so-called worst schools in Detroit. By the end of 2011-2012 school year, Detroit public schools no, no longer operated a single neighborhood public high school. They were either in the recovery district, they were selective enrollment schools, or they were charter schools. On March 1, as I said before, that's a few days ago, the governor appointed an emergency manager to run the entire city. And this is uh, what has also happened to five other um, mostly African-American cities in Michigan. Um, Amy Goodman said on Democracy Now!, so that's my source for this particular data point, which we'll have to look up and find is true. She said that over half of the African-American residents of the, of the state of Michigan are now under uh, disenfranchisement, emergency managers. Downsizing the city and positioning for a new round of capital accumulation depends on pushing out the very people who once made Detroit an industrial powerhouse. So we should be clear that the wealth was produced by the auto workers and the people who worked in Detroit. They produced the wealth that, um, that made the, the auto company rich and that built the city and they're the ones who are being pushed out, Detroit's black working class. This is a project that can only be accomplished, or at least fast-tracked, by preventing Detroit's black voters from having any say in their destiny. In Chicago, the mayor-appointed Board of Education is composed of corporate CEOs, bankers, and real estate magnates. Penny Pritzker, the 641st richest person in the United States, um, uh, Vitali, who's the chair of the Board of Education, CEO, whatever he's called, the chair of the Board of Education, was a former um, head of the Chicago Board of Trade. He's a transnational finance capitalist. This is who runs the school board. They make decisions um, behind closed doors. They, they discuss and vote behind closed doors um, on the fates of thousands of black and Latino school children. Chicago Public Schools is 92% students of color and 86% low income. Contrived public hearings leading up to these decisions have become notorious for their mockery of democracy. Um, so in 2012, when they were threatening to close um, a bunch of schools, black and Latino communities proposed plans to transform their schools. They said, we, we're, we don't want our schools closed, but we know they need to be improved, and we have proposals for how to actually transform our schools. Um, they sat in for a week um, at the mayor's office, um, and despite doing all this and calling for repeated meetings with Chicago Public Schools, no one in authority in Chicago Public Schools ever looked at this proposal that they had spent 18 months developing with education experts and community participation, et cetera. People have testified, including me, rallied, marched, picketed, petitioned, held candlelight vigils, sat in, slept out in winter, including me, and more and more 
but there is no elected body to hold accountable. Students from closed schools are to be assigned to other schools, likely across neighborhood turf lines. Thousands of outraged parents and students and teachers have come out to the CPS hearings that have been going on for the past two months um, to insist that their schools not be closed. In particular, they've been citing fears for um, their children's safety. But they've also produced, and of course I left it at home, I wanted to bring just to show you, they produced these extensive documents in which they've actually done an analysis of the utilization of their schools and found that every room is occupied, that every room is being utilized, and that CPS's utilization rates are completely incorrect, which I'm not surprised about because I participated, I worked with a, a school, two different schools that were threatened to be closed in 2008 and 2009, in which we actually mapped out the whole school and calculated the rates, and they were dramatically different from what Chicago Public Schools just has a formula and someone sits in an office, and, and, and then based on this formula, they say the school is under-enrolled. So the pairs have been outraged, and they've been coming out, and you can see all these protests on YouTube. It's like 2,000 people at a hearing, and they're all over the city. But there's, they're also fighting for, for um, they're not just fighting to, have their to not have their schools be closed. They're not just concerned about the violence. They are um, fighting for the places that they have carved out of schools disinvested by the state and dominated by the stifling effects of top-down accountability. So on the one hand, CPS is really producing these minimalist schools. But when you go in the schools, they're not just minimalist schools. That's really, that's really not what's happening. Because what's happening in the schools is that parents and teachers and community people are getting together and they're figuring out how to have dance programs and jazz bands and um, science projects and art projects and restorative justice and things that they're eking out of you know, community participation and grants that they write and whatever to try to construct these schools as schools that are worthy of their children and schools that are for their children real spaces of, um, of um, affirmation and community. So I'm, I don't want to romanticize the schools at all. They're very complex. That's actually what I'm trying to say. They're very complex. They are not the demonized, pathologized schools in black communities that is the popular discourse. Neither are they completely gutted by policy. They are a mix, and they are a mix as people are trying to do something um, with little. I guess is what you could say, within a certain environment with certain neoliberal um, ideologies. Um, every school community actually has a story to tell about this. And as I've been going to the community hearings, you know, you listen to it and you say, wow, you know, every school has something good that they could build on, that they could reinvent the school. You know, they have a great cultural program, or they have a group of very committed teachers, or they have um, a group of parents who are totally committed to the <coughs> school, or they have a great um, a science curriculum or whatever. Um, so these are, um, I think, um, efforts to turn what George Lipsitz calls racialized space, um, which is a product of persistent racial segregation and geographically organized economic and educational vulnerabilities into what Bell Hooks calls home places. Black spaces of cultural production, affirmation, mutuality, and resistance. School under enrollment and failure that's a quote, are produced through what Lipsitz calls the fatal couplings of race and place and capital that systematically advantage whites and disadvantage aggrieved people of color. The violence of closing African American schools en masse is violence against the community as a whole. So in the, in the hearings you hear like um, a, a voice that kind of resonated in um, just because the statement is so simple and profound, I guess, um, one of the parents in the North Lawndale hearing was, don't close our school, don't close none of the schools in North Lawndale. We need all our schools. So, I mean, that's the, the sentiment. Um, so, in conclusion, African American and Latino residents, and I haven't talked much about Latino residents, who are somewhat, um, they're not the, the, really the focus of this mass of school closings, but they are included. Um, and there are some whites, too, um, and I'll talk about this tomorrow. Um, African-American and Latino residents of Chicago and Detroit do not need to be told about the connection between education and the restructuring of their cities. They don't need us to come and tell them about the 
intersections of race, capital, and education policy. It is apparent that plans do not include them. In fact, I learned this from them, <laughs> the other way around. They are largely disposable, except as potential commodities, and it is not necessary to obtain their consent. This is neoliberal urban governance by exclusion. Quote, a form of economic, spatial, and symbolic violence against the poor, where hegemonic actors do not see the potential, need, or possibility of organizing a more inclusionary enrollment strategy, end quote, says uh, Jonathan Davies, uh, urban scholar. This is a form, I would argue, of colonial rule, to not be hyperbolic. I think it is a form of colonial rule. Such a strategy is vulnerable to oppositional political mobilization. It lays bare the logics of race and capital and naked power behind the hegemony of neoliberal responses to the crisis. The crisis also opens up space for counter-hegemonic resistance, which is um, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, in a very undialectical way. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. Yep. So now there's time for some questions, comments, and I'll let you handle it. Okay. Critiques are welcome. Can you talk a little bit more about the connection between these homicide killings and the school closing? Yeah. Um, actually, um, one of the, the community organizations that I work really closely with, the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, which is in Bronzeville, um, the homicide rates in Bronzeville increased 300% um, uh, over the last, um, since 2006. And, um, and so we have this, this dramatic increase in, in youth homicides in particular. And so we were talking about, so we were doing this small research, collaborating with a small research project together to actually um, do research and analysis that they have been using um, both for the journey for justice and, and the, the fights that they've been waging. And so um, G2 Brown, who's the, the education organizer, and I were talking about how could, we, how could we think about that connection and how do we sort of document it. And so I've been doing some looking into it. And, and what I have to say is this, that there is no single cause. So we cannot draw a causal connection between school closings and increases in violence. Um, there is a constellation of factors that are all the ones that probably anyone in here could name, right? Um, the destruction of public housing, uh, CPS's gang policy, which um, 10 years ago, I guess it was, they decided to lock up all the gang leaders. Um, they thought that would be a good idea. And, you know, it's, I'm not a proponent of gangs, but the way the gangs worked was there were a few big gangs. They had the city divided up into turf as long as you stayed in your own area. I mean, they were basically um, economic, you know, they were businesses, economic operations, doing stuff that I don't support, but no nonetheless, right? Um, but um, they, they lacked up the leaders, and so that um, created this proliferation of gangs. So there's so many gangs now that, you know, there's a new one every week that people haven't heard of. Um, and, and gang rivalries. A, a, about blocks and stuff like that. So there's that factor. There's the destruction of public housing and all the displacement and, and destabilization that that's caused, the destruction of public health clinics, the, um, the disinvestment in communities, um, and school closings. Um, and school closings have led to spikes in violence. Um, and that's because people, because CPS has transferred kids from the Austin neighborhood on the far west side to Humboldt Park which is a, a Puerto Rican and Mexican community um, across many turf lines and, ex and expected that to go well, even though everyone in the community said, do not do this. Um, and and so, so school closings are definitely part of it. The other thing is that I don't ever like to talk about violence without talking about um, violence more holistically, because this does not speak to the, the violence of poverty, the violence of racism, the violence of, of um, unemployment, the violence of schools that are not fit for children to be going to school in. Um, and so there are multiple violences going on in Chicago. And there is a, a real danger when we talk about violence and actually playing into the pathologies that are now 
um, wildly circulating in, in Chicago. So it's not a one, to, I, you know, it's not a, 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 a causal, kind of, it's a cause, um, but it's certainly not the only cause, but it's a contributory factor, right? And these are all policies. Every one of these are policies. So this is not, there's nothing inherent in people. These are policies that have produced conditions that, that produce um, anger and, and, in, and instability and pain. And there is a lot of pain underneath the violence that's happening. Mm -hmm. Someone's wait time. Um, it's a very kind of dark picture you yeah. kind of paint. Um, how much is, uh, I mean, Rahm Emanuel obviously is connected to the White House and the Obama administration. Uh, how much is uh, the Obama administration itself um, involved in kind of carrying forward this agenda uh, on schools across the country? Um, they're very central to it. So it's a... Um, it's a reciprocal process. I mean, these, these policies were born in Chicago. I'm going to actually talk about that more concretely tomorrow. Um, but with Renaissance 2010, the Chicago Renaissance 2010 plan, which was a plan developed by the, it was a proposal from the Commercial Club of Chicago, which Mayor Daly enacted. Um, and, um, and that was carried out by Arnie Duncan when he was CEO of schools in Chicago. And then Obama made him Secretary of Education. And that became a national, that's a, a part of the backbone for Race to the Top, which was a $4.3 billion um, fund to a re part of the recovery, um, the recovery from the crisis, to fund school districts as long as they, they would essentially do those things. So there is a, and you know what, um, um, it, it is a national agenda, and it does come from the Obama administration. Um, and um, the Obama administration has used Chicago as a model. So the Chicago miracle is Obama used to run around the country calling, talking about the Chicago miracle before he was made Secretary of Education. The Chicago miracle is now sort of the model. Even though all the data, I mean, even just within their framework, kids haven't gone to better schools. Only six six percent of students from closed schools went to schools that were, you know, actually high performing schools from their framework. 80% um, went to schools the same or worse. Um, there's been spikes in violence. There's been destabilization. The city's been involved in a constant um, process, which I'm also going to talk about tomorrow in terms of how neoliberalism works, of fixing its errors and experimenting with something else and then fixing that. Um, so it's a failed policy, um, even from their framework, um, and it, but it is very much uh, rooted in the, in the White House. Can I? I'd like to speak to that because I think for me it's an imperative that you keep it in that violence context, even when talking about uh, the historical violence and, and for folks of color. And I think it oversimplifies at some level for me the pointing at Obama's um, what, do, what do folks of color do, right? And here in Madison, you know, we can look far with the discussions about charter schools and who's doing it and neoliberalism. You just really captured that for me. But I think it's at some level overly simplified. He may be continuing, but who are the folks that are saying we have to do something radical, right? What is the, what is the notion? And I, I agree with much of your argument, but I, I, I bristle against having Obama be the focus of, or, or only his policies, what do brown and black folks do, you know, in said context where we realize that when you, you captured it in a way that feels awesome to have a white person be saying much of what you're saying, and obviously not the only one, I, I, I need some real context with, with what, he, what what is real and what folks are dealing with, um, like him trying to create something that does speak to the decrease in violence since he's been in Chicago and, and in some of the areas, um, not advocating for violence, but there, what is the pill that, that, that the folks that are having those schools closed, what is the pill that you will be providing for your scholarship to help these other scholars? Mm -hmm. um. Let me respond to that, but, and if I'm not, stop me if I'm not Great. speaking to what you were saying. Um, <clears throat> so um, I agree that focusing on Obama is not, I mean, it's important to say that it's a national agenda, but the particular, the school closing thing is a more recent um, strategy 
uh, began in Chicago in 2004. It was it's really been pushed nationally over the last four uh, years, which has been under the Obama administration. But it's it's a continuation of a larger agenda. I mean, let's think about um, um, top-down accountability, high-stakes testing, no child left behind. This is a bipartisan agenda, so you know it's not about Democrats or Republicans. This is a bipartisan, this is a neoliberal agenda. It's a global agenda. It's not just an agenda in the U.S. Um, and we, I think, you know, we're, we're familiar with that, right? So, um, so the school closings are part of, you know, the whole accountability is what makes schools legible for being declared failures and being closed. Um, so, um, so, but it is important to say that it's, it's sanctioned at the national level. It's supported at the national level. Um, discursively and practically in terms of um, funding and support and, and all that kind of thing. Um, but so this is what's um, what you raised, if I understand what you raised, is what's wrong with my talk, um, which is these two parts. <laughs> um, because it's very it's kind of like, okay, here's this situation. Now tomorrow I'm gonna talk about the pushback situation, but they're in and tomorrow I'm gonna talk about the dialectics mm -hmm. of the that, okay, I'm not just going to say, and then there's a pushback, but, you know, what, what how do these policies create certain um, fissures, certain blowback, certain contradictions, um, both for the people who are directly affected, which in this case is, is black and brown folks for the most case, for the most part, but also we're seeing um, fissures because of what's actually happened to middle class whites, and so I want to sort of map out what the hegemonic Black looks like to be sort of um, overly grand, uh, maybe, and um, and then look at you know where are those fish? What's happening in that? Um, that so I think that um, and this is something I'm going to say tomorrow too. That there's one thing that I I found really helpful, and it's um it's an in thinking about this a little bit. It's an article by Clark and Newman. I've of course forgotten the name of it. It's 2010. It's in Journal of Education Policy, um, where they talk about the, the crisis, I, I quoted something from it today, and the, um, the opportunities that, that it presents, um, the discourses of the crisis, and they, they talk about, um, and they're actually responding to uh, someone else. Mm -hmm. and, and what they talk about in there is that, um, where do we look for alternatives to what exists? And that there is a tendency for us, and I would, um, accuse myself of this in my book, actually, um, is um, in sort of looking to something that, that has not happened here. And, this is, and, and so they argue that we need to look at residual and emergent discourses and practices mm -hmm. as they actually exist, right? And so the, they talk about residual discourses and practices of fairness, of the common good, uh, you know, and which are liberal, this is liberal stuff. This is not, you know, this is not um, communism or something. <laughs> you know, it's liberal stuff. Um, but, um, but it's actually directly counter to the whole neoliberal ideology and this whole thing of the possessive individualism, competitive consumerism and all of that. So I think that um, what, we're, what I'm seeing happening is that, um, like the African American parents and and students who've banded together in this um, journey for justice, which is a which they're calling a, a, a civil rights struggle, and there's they're trying to reappropriate civil rights because remember the right took away civil rights. You know, no child left behind, the soft bigotry, the low expectations, um, choices, self determination. They took all that away. So they're saying we were we're going to take that back. And we're going to have a, a journey for justice that, that evokes the, um, the freedom rights. And what they're calling for is kind of what they've been working on is, um, in some senses, just a step. Um, so they're saying we want a school community-based process of school transformation. And that it embodies, although they don't use this language, multiple epistemologies. It assumes that the people in, in communities, the parents, the teachers have knowledge. And if, if they have the well-being, you know, this is not rocket science exactly. If, they, if we have the well-being of children, that we can transform our schools, not, not close them. So one of the problems has been with the 
opposition to the neoliberal agenda is that there's been an uncritical defense of the public. Yes. But the public has not served some people well. I mean, you know, those of us, <laughs> right? We've been the big critics of the public. Public schools, they reproduce social inequality, right? Um, and, and so now they're, they're cheerleaders for the public. So that's not us, but they're cheerleaders for the public. So that's not it either. We actually have to ask, what kind of public are we talking about? Whose public is it? How can we reinvent the public? How can we expand the public? And that's, I think, what they're working on within that kind of framework. So I think that there are, so I don't I, does that speak to what you're asking? Yes. No. <laughs> Michael. I, can I say something? Sure. Okay. So, Michael Olnick was my advisor when I did my PhD here. So, I'm, I was very nervous today because, <laughs> <laughs> because I, cause I don't know what he's thinking. And he was like the most incredible critic of my dissertation. It's like, which is the best thing to have is a very harsh critic. So, okay, Michael. I <laughs> so mellowed. <laughs> Actually, I, I think my question, even though I, it occurred to me before you spoke, is, uh, is related, uh, but coming at it uh, from the other side of, well, how do we think positively? It's um, assuming that the state actors, the Arnie Duncans of the world, <laughs> the Obamas, etc., are not merely looking for a, um, a way to make a killing on uh, cheap real estate. Um, mm -hmm. How do you understand, or help us understand, the discourses that somehow they've adopted and are using in the name of social amelioration? They would not if they were, I, I, I don't know if there's a, if Rahm Emanuel has kind of a, the opposite of a Pauline Lipman, a scholar that's, uh, supportive of what he's doing, um, but the, pretend he does. Uh, just like Blair had get some something. Um, assuming that they're not simply trying to uh, solve the problem of accumulation and falling profit rates, uh, how, do you, how do you understand how they're making sense of what they're doing, and does that, if we can accomplish that kind of understanding, does it open any way to make the critique? You want to make more sense, sensible beyond rooms like this. Is that, is that, is that a sensible I think a question? question. That's a, I think it's a fair question because I, I don't know what we do in that empty space where they have brown skin faces and they know all the bullshit and they know that it is a part of this neoliberalism that you're crafting, but there, there's also within me the belief that who else is fighting for brown skin kids in the way that he's starting to unfold similarly, you know, I don't know that I, Obama's not the safest for all for me, but I'm also needing some, you know, who is in that space or who's... Well, um... That's a really good question. I mean, that's really something to think about more. That's the kind of question I need to think about more. Um, and so, it wasn't critical. No, no, no but, <laughs> I, but I, I knew it would, it would be a hard question. Um, I, I, it's a really good question, and and so I think that, um, and it's appropriate because I think, you know, if I think about what I said and I think about your question, um, it could be um, complicated more um, by responding to that. So I think there is an ideological component. Um, I think there is a actually a belief that markets are the solution, um, despite the fact that markets have gotten us into so much trouble. Um, so I think there is an ideological component. Um, I think that um, there is a a deep and profound 
um, contempt for low-income people and people of color in the sense that nothing good can come from um, their communities or their ideas. That there is no, that there is a sense that whatever should be done will be done by some social actors up here. And, and I mean, I, I see that profoundly in Chicago when people go to the Board of Education, when you could go to the Board of Education, they just, they're, they're in such a defensive mode that now they've closed it down and can't even go to the Board of Education anymore. But that people, when we used to go to the Board of Education meetings and people would um, talk about their situations, that um, Penny Pursuit would be texting the whole time. Um, so. Um, there, there's a deep and profound, so I think there's a, a kind of elitism, a deep and profound uh, contempt. Um, there is an ideological component. There is uh, racism, white supremacy, um, the, that is linked to, it is, yes, capital accumulation. So what is Rahm Emanuel's job as mayor? His job is to make Chicago the most competitive city possible in the global economy. That's his job. And that involves many things. It means a certain quality of life. It means school, certain kind of schools for certain people. It means uh, where people live, neighborhoods, restaurants, culture, real estate, all that stuff. Um, it means uh, attracting investors. It means revamping the infrastructure, which is why he's got this consortium going. That's, that's his job. And um, that's what governance is. Um, and, and he needs to do that in a way that keeps things flowing and not exploding, if you will. And sometimes that requires containment in order to make that happen. Um, and sometimes it requires convincing people as the, the preachers that they've paid off, um, the, the random preachers, as we call them in Chicago, and the paid protesters and all of that. So there, there's that aspect. Um, I think that... Um, it's hard. Okay, so maybe I should stop. So, so I, I, th I think it's those things. Could we hear some female voices just for the social justice element? And it's those things that are, are it's like there's this place here, and there's, there's what you're saying, and then there's this, there's, there's this like, macro reality mm -hmm. of um, Western, you know. It's almost on July, so it's just like, this is who we are. And so the question is, it remains again, it's like when you tell the story of, but when you go into these schools and go into these communities, we see what's going on, we see where that is. But then when you tell this bigger story of the, of the global sort of, you know, relationships and the capitalistic whatever, you know, with the White House, the Obama administration, and the, the Bill Gates and that feels like something that is formidable. It's like it's just like how yes. that it, it it it's very hard to uh, maintain a, 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 a feeling of hope. Yes, and you know staying in there anyway. You know it's like to balance. Our, um, you sat here and said racism and white supremacy and you know every every corner you turn you really laid out who is being affected by these policies and, and such that are going on in Detroit. I mean, that was this, I, I, I mean, I know these things, but you know, this, this the way you created this sort of the not ideal and how this is being impacted is, it's enormous. Yes, right. And and so I, so I do think, I'm really being serious, that that is, probably a problem with the way I've sort of figured what I was going to do in these two days. Because, um, so let me tell a story this way. So for some reason that I will never know, but it was just a fluke, um, I was invited to, and I think it was in 2008 or something, I think I put this in my book, um, a, uh, an event sponsored by the Renaissance Schools Fund. The Renaissance School Fund is an arm of the Commercial Club of Chicago. The Commercial Club of Chicago is over 100 years old. It's an organization with the most powerful corporate and financial interests in the city, along with some civic leaders and presidents of universities and stuff. 
And they sponsored this event, which was on the 80th floor of the AM building, which is a building in Chicago that's like out into, like built out into Lake Michigan, where you have to like go through moats and stuff to get into the building. And they sponsored this gala event, which was about, that Arnie Duncan was the key speaker at, which was, must have been before 2008 then, 2006, that was all about Renaissance, uh, Renaissance 2010, and there were people there from cities around the country learning about Renaissance 2010, and there were workshops, and somehow I was invited to it, which is great, because it was like a, you know, I, I got to see what was going on, right? And, and so I looked out the window of the Aon building, and I, we were on the 80th floor of the Aon building. And you look out there, and you could, I could see all of Lake, you know, I could see all the way down to Indiana. It was a clear day, and all the way up the lake. And I could see nothing but skyscrapers. And the people down on the ground are like ants. And that's kind of like, wow, they have all this power. They have all this money. They have all this, you know, skyscrapers, steel and, and glass, right? And we are like ants. So that is pro but that's not correct. That's not actually what's happening, and it's problematic. And part of it is because neoliberalism has been reified. Just like capitalism has been reified, but neoliberalism has been reified. It's not a, it's not a crisis-ridden process. It's a thing that's bigger than anything we've ever seen before that we are ants against. But it's, but it's actually, it's relational. First of all, it's in re those processes are in relation to what other social forces are doing. And neoliberalism, let's remember, was an attempt to fix a structural crisis of capitalism in the 1970s. It was a fix. And, um, and it was a fix that has moved, as, as Jamie Peck and Neil Brenner and, and Nick Theodore talk about, by lurching. Um, they use a the phrase, falling forward. Lurching from crisis to crisis. There was a dot-com crisis in the 90s. How did they fix that? By having low interest rates. The low interest rates was what brought all this capital into the housing market. How did that turn out? Not so well. So actually, and we could talk about education, and that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So this is a crisis-ridden process that is, is filled with contradictions. And, and so if we don't understand that, we, don't, we, we are ants against you know, um, the 80th floor of the, the Aeon building, when I think it's much more dialectical, much more complicated, and, and we're in a particular historical moment. We're in a crisis. Their solutions to the crisis, which are austerity, can only deepen the crisis. So the New York Times said, I think it was yesterday, wages in the US are the lowest they've been since 1962. Corporate profits are the highest they've ever been. Productivity is higher than it's been in I don't know how many years. That means fewer people are producing more stuff that's making more money for very few people. That's totally unsustainable. So, that, so it's a danger and opportunity moment. The danger is that, that that situation can only be sustained through coercion. Mm -hmm. That's the danger. And the they're putting the apparatus in place. They have drones for cities. Do you think those are for like Kenilworth, Illinois, or something like that? You know, or in case there's like a outbreak of grasshoppers somewhere or something? I mean, so you know, the the systems are in place, right? But um, this is a crisis-ridden solution that cannot solve the problem. So it's really a moment for what used to be called the subjective factor. It's about what we do. It is, a, it is about what we do. So that's why we need to understand it. That's why we need to, so what I want to try to do tomorrow is, I, this is all a plug for you to come back tomorrow, but, um, <laughs> but what I want you to do tomorrow, what I want to do tomorrow is I want to look at very concretely in Chicago, I'm making an attempt, to look at how is hegemony constructed, where are the fissures in it, how is it actually breaking apart in this crisis, and how are we trying to take advantage of that, and what are the possibilities? So I really appreciate your comment because um, I really appreciate your comment. It's exactly correct. Unless we think about it that way, we're yes. doomed. Ants, yes. we're ants. On that note, uh, since it is time, uh, just thank you very much.